All right. Okay. All right. So I'm just gonna get back to this. So I got one more rule to cover, and then uh, I'll lay out the actual algorithm to train an SOM, and then uh, I'll do a nice small concrete example. Okay. So the, so we talked about compatible learning. We talked about cooperation. And the last rule we have to take a look at is what's known as adaptation. Okay. So we make sure that for similar input examples, they should roughly map to the same area in the self-organizing map. So you want not only just the best matching unit to activate, but you know, neurons in close proximity to the best matching unit should also activate you know, for similar input examples. Okay? So how we do this is we train using stochastic gradient descent. And there is a learning rate that's, in, uh, that's involved. Okay, so we update uh, the weights. Uh, using stochastic gradient descent. Okay, uh, SGD for short. For short. Okay, so there is a learning rate. Has a learning rate. Alpha like, that, we're, that we're very familiar with. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, after each presented example. What's customarily done is that you make the learning rate and the uh, decay factor H, you actually make them decay over time. Make, you make them shrink over time. So after each example that you present, the learning rate actually decreases over time. And the reason why you're doing that is because you'll allow um, input neurons that are dissimilar to the best matching unit to, be, to have a chance to be mapped into another part of the self-organizing math. So if you don't let these decay, what's going to happen is that you'll have a large neighborhood which will not allowed to be uh, mapped to dissimilar inputs to that particular area. So you're not giving them a chance to, and you're not giving, you're not giving dissimilar inputs a chance to be able to map onto um, other areas of the self-organizing map. So after each presented example, uh, we make uh, the learning rate. Uh, so the learning rate alpha and decay shrink over time. So it's customary that you do that. Okay. So this ensures that uh, less similar neurons uh, you know compared to the uh, BMU uh, can be updated uh, with more similar examples to those neurons. Okay, so that's the point of decreasing the uh, stuff over time. All right. So, so this is the formal definition of the update, and then we will go on to the actual uh, algorithm itself. Okay, so given an input example, which we'll call X, and it consists of, uh, sorry, it consists of uh, N features. Okay, oopsie. Okay, so there's N features. All right. Okay. So if wi or wij or omega is the weight for neuron i or ij in a 1 or 2D grid, depending on what you're looking at. If it's a 1D grid, you just take a look at one subscript. If it's a 2D grid, then you take a look at, you know, I and J. Okay? If that is the weight, you know, of a neuron I in the, in the output grid, the update is basically, so at iteration or time index T, the update is the following. So if I, so this is the 1D case. If I want to figure out what the next update is, Call this t plus one. Okay, this is equal to the previous update. Okay, plus your learning rate. It's also going to be indexed by t. I'll talk about this in a little bit, as well as the decay. It's also t, and then 
you just subtract with. Okay, and let me just write down the 2D case and I'll explain this. I'll explain this notation in more detail. Let me just write this down for the 1D and 2D case. The 2D case is similar. You're just having another degree of freedom to deal with. Okay, so what, what does this actually mean? What does this actual stuff mean? Okay, so this here, right? This is the uh, learning rate. Decayed over time. Okay, so what I mean by this is we're going to have some initial learning rate that we have, and we usually use the exponential function to, de to determine decay. So e to the power of t, and then there's some factor here, which we'll call tau 1, which will determine how fast this exponential decays. So the larger this number is, the less of a decay you have. The smaller this number is, the more of a decay you have. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this here is the uh, rate of shrinkage, I guess. You can call it shrinkage. Right, and this is the uh, initial uh, learning rate. Okay, so at the very first iteration, you have your full strength learning rates. And then as the iterations pass, when t is equal to 1, 2, 3, you'll notice that the learning rate decreases over time, depending on this exponential function. And then you get to a point where it becomes really small, you don't do any more updates. So learning rate is decayed over time. Okay, so that's the rate of shrinkage. And then we also have uh, this guy here, which is the decay function, but it's also, so decay function, uh, not decayed, but I guess shrink, shrunk over time, not decayed, because I, keep, I'm no, I don't want to keep using uh, two different terms to mean two different things, or two same terms to mean two different things. So shrunk over time. Okay, so this is the same as uh, you know the previous decay function, but there's a time index instead now. Okay, so this for, this is for the one decay. So we have let's see here. This was where are we? Yep. Uh, let me see here. What's going on? Okay, good. So this is e to the power. Okay. So what's going to happen is that the standard deviation has some time factor to it. Okay, so remember the Gaussian. How the Gaussian works is that it controls the width of the bell curve. Of, of the bell curve. So a smaller standard deviation means that you are, you know, your uh, radius is smaller. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the standard deviation and apply shrinkage to it. So at the very beginning, you lost some standard deviation, and then over time, this standard deviation becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So, the, so remember, this will, this determines the size of the neighborhood. So as you start decreasing the standard deviation, that neighborhood of where you actually apply the strengths is also going to decrease as well. So we apply a, de a shrinkage to the actual standard deviation. Okay, so, uh, and then for the 2D case, this is 1D, and then 2D is simply this, and I'll define this in a little bit, this standard deviation stuff. So this is E, and then not much of a stretch when you go to 2D. Okay, now this here is the uh, standard deviation shrunk over time. And it's pretty much the same thing as the above with the, uh, with the learning rate. So you're just, you have some sort of initial standard deviation that you have, and you apply some exponential term to it, which I'll call here tau 2. Okay, so tau 1 and tau 2, that's the rate of shrinkage. So th this is rate of shrinkage again. Okay, and then this is your initial uh, standard deviation. Okay, so that's all that. So you have this, this, and then this here, this is the weight for the next iteration. Sorry. Okay, and then this is uh, current iteration. Okay, and that's your training example and so on. So that's all, that's all explanatory. So this is input example. I'm just going to put that in. Okay, so what does this actually mean? Well, this difference here is actually very important. So what this difference does is that the, this, this difference means that the smaller the difference would be, the more similar the uh, input example will be to this particular unit. 
So because this difference is small, the update you don't have to make you don't have to make as much of an update. So the larger the difference, the larger the update you make. So that's the significance behind this difference. It actually controls how much of an update you need. So if the input example is very similar to this particular neuron that's in the neighborhood, you don't have to do much of an update. But if it's larger, then you have to do a more significant update. Okay. So <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, so the initial, actually, let me just write one more point. So usually, the initial standard deviation is n over 2 for 1D, or, uh, no, sorry, it's n, small n for number of neurons, right? Or, uh, okay, so this is number of output neurons, okay, and this is number of rows, and this is number of columns. Yeah, what we do is if you want, so we usually initialize the standard deviation to be half the width, so it allows you to be able to stretch uh, as, you know, to as many neurons as possible, and then you shrink that over time. Well, that's usually the accepted practice. You make the initial standard deviation, deviation to be that. Okay, I forgot to put that in. Okay, so there are other, you know, functions for, you know, the learning rate and the standard deviation if you want to shrink them over time, but exponential is the most common. Okay, I'll make one last point about this different stuff. I just mentioned it, but I forgot to write that down. I'll do that, and then we'll actually go through the algorithm. Okay, so the difference... Let me just move this up so you can write that down if you wish. So the difference... Or... Okay, this difference helps update the best matching unit. So similar inputs uh, allow uh, this to, sorry, have uh, a higher chance in being selected the next time. A, you know, the same input is presented. So that's the point of that difference. Okay? So that's, 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 that's just the point I wanted to make. Okay, so enough of that stuff. Let's actually, I'm going to cover the actual algorithm and I'll do a concrete example. So here's the SLM algorithm in a nutshell. Okay, so the first thing you need are some things that you have to be given. So first off, you have to decide how many input neurons you want, which is usually the number of features that you have. It's pretty cool. Okay? You also have to have a bunch of examples that, you know, they're not, you know, they don't, obviously they don't need to be labeled, that are of n features. And then you have to decide how many output neurons you want. It totally depends on your application. So if you wanted to talk about, let's say, you know, mapping out the uh, poverty of different countries, then each output neuron would be one country. So it just, you have to figure, you know, there's no good answer to determine how many output neurons you need. It just depends on your application and just intuition, unfortunately. Okay, so determine uh, how many input neurons you need. And that's easy. So you just need N of them, which corresponds to N features. Okay, uh, let's see here. You also need examples. So you're going to need m of these examples, right? So you have x, okay, we have m examples, okay? You'll also have to decide on the structure and number of output neurons. 
that you have to figure out by based on the application that you're trying to use this for and just the, the data that you have. It just depends. Okay? All right. So let's see here. Okay, we got that, we got that, so decide that. And then finally, one. Initialization. So what we usually do is we usually initialize all the whites to be random. So they're usually, they're usually either small and random values that are of the same dimensions as you know, the input neurons, or you can just choose each neuron to be a random selection of your training examples that you have. So they're, they're one, or one or the other is fine. So initialize all weights of each output neuron. Uh, you know, uh, to be small or uh, randomly choose from the examples. Okay? So, uh, you have this. Also, we need to set uh, the initial uh, spread, the initial EK, and the learning rate. Okay. Also, what I'd like to mention is that, oh yeah, set this. You also need the uh, decay factors tau 1 and tau 2. Okay, and also like to point out that the larger tau is, the less of a decay or less of a shrinkage is performed at each time step. and vice versa. Okay, so you have initialized all the weights, you set, uh, sorry, this is alpha, not, uh, not the same thing again, my bad. Okay, you set those as well. And then, let's see here. Okay, initialize. Okay, so what I mean by this is initialize. So at time step zero, for all I'll put layer neurons. Okay, and time is set to zero. So these weights are indexed by time index, which will tell you what the weights, how the weights are evolving over time. So the initial weights are just going to be um, all these you know, weights that we talked about above. So that's the initialization step. <clears throat> all right. Here we go. Here's the training step. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to repeat until all weights show little change. So here's the following process for training a self-organizing map. So what you're going to do first is you're going to choose a random example and store in a variable called, you know, small case x. Okay. Now what you're going to do is once you have this example, you're going to figure out where the best matching unit would be for this input example to the all of the nodes in the S uh, in the S O N. Okay. So find the best matching unit x. Right. So what we want to do is we want to find the distances d of x and w. Okay. So this would be the input example, and this is a weight. So you want to find the distances between the weights and the actual example. So when you want to find the best matching unit, I didn't talk about this. All you have to do is just figure out what the distance is between the weights, which are an n-dimensional vector, and the input example, which is also an n-dimensional vector. And the distance that is the smallest would constitute as the best matching unit. Okay. Now, if there is more than one best matching unit that is possible, which means that you have you know, some neurons that share the same distance between the input neuron and all the neurons in the output, then you just randomly choose one of them to serve as the best matching unit. Okay? So, <clears throat> so find the best matching unit. So for 1D, okay, it's basically, so the best matching unit is you want to find the position such that the difference between this is minimized, okay? 
Okay, and for the 2D case, you want to figure out what the position is that'll minimize the distance between, uh, oh sorry, this is X. We're talking about position here. Uh, yes. When you, I, oh sorry, da, 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 da. yeah, it's fine. And, yeah, sorry, this is the inputting, okay, yeah, and X, fine, sure. Okay, so we want to figure out what the, uh, what weight will satisfy this distance here. So whatever weight that, whatever um, neuron gives us the smallest distance from that particular weight, that vector with the actual input example, that's the one you choose. Okay, so we're going to use the Euclidean distance. Okay, and, but in, in, if you take a look at the 1D, it's just the absolute difference, which is the same thing. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, let's see. So Euclidean distance, that's fine. So what we want to do is we want to choose the neuron with the smallest distance. So that's the point of the step. Okay, so that's the second case. So the next would be if there is more than one BMU, randomly choose one of them. Okay, it happens rarely, but if in the off chance that you do encounter this situation, just randomly choose one. Okay. But uh, if I were to ask you a question like this, I'll make sure that there's no random choice. That, uh, uh, you know, so just to make sure there's, there should only be one answer when I make a question up. Okay? All right. So now, once you figure out what the BMU is, you need to update the neuron weights. Okay. So what you do here is you just simply apply those equations that we talked about above. So. So the next one will be the previous one, and then you add your update. So this is our learning rate. This is our decay, which is um, shrinking over time. And finally, the difference between that input example and the associated weight of that iteration. And then you also have the case for 2D. I didn't cover 3D because it's actually a little more complicated. It's, it's following the same principle, but it's just uh, the notation is pretty heavy, pretty heavy, so you can you can extrapolate this to 3D if you want, but we won't uh, cover that here. Okay, so you're gonna update the neuron weights that way, okay? And then you also have you know these equations. You know you got the alpha, you got the learning rate. Okay, you also have the standard deviation as well. Okay. And then you also have the decay. So this is e to the power. So this is for 1D. Uh, okay. Okay, and this is for 2D. Same principle. But uh, there are two components to consider. Okay. So those, the, so that's that's the stuff you do. So first, you let's see here. Uh, you compute the you know the learning rate. You compute the standard deviation. Then you compute the actual decay, and then you plug it all in. So once you do that, all you have to do next is increment time step. And that's it. So you keep doing this. So the, so the first step would be, OK, so first choose a random example. The next step would be find the best matching unit, whichever neuron it will mat best match the uh, input with that particular neuron. You find the best matching unit. And then once you do this, you figure out what the neuron, you just update the neuron weights. So um, choose a random example, figure out what the best matching unit is update the neural weights, and then you keep iterating, keep iterating until the weights don't exhibit much of a change. Okay, so you know, that's, uh, you know, that's all fine and good. Let's actually do an example. So I did a lot of theory. Let's actually do an example. 
<coughs> so a numerical example. Okay, so let's say we have two input features so far. Or, you know, we have two uh, input neurons. And we have three output uh, neurons. And I'd like to mention that this case is just for 1D. Just for saving time and showing you an actual example. So this is a numerical example of 1D. Okay, so what I mean by this is that the SOM is going to look like this. Okay. So you have two features, and then you have three output layer neurons, and then you're going to have you know, some connections that will form between each of the input layers neurons with each of the output layer neurons. Okay, so yeah, that's fine. And then finally, uh, this guy here, I guess. Okay, so something like that. <coughs> okay, so here, here we are, and then let's say my initial weights. So we need to initialize the algorithm. So let's say my initial weights are the first one. So this is the first one, the second one, the third one. The first one, we'll say that the weights are all zero. This is two dimensions. The next one, let's say we have one zero. And finally, the next one after that will be zero one. Let's say for, you know, for the moment that these are the initial weights. Okay. I've also chosen my um, rates of shrinkage between both of them to be the same. Let's do 1.45. Okay. I also have my initial um, DK, you know, the initial rate, the neighborhood decay to be 0 0.5, and the learning rate, the initial one is going to be 1. Okay, so these are the initial parameters. And let's say here are my input examples. So I just have two for now. Okay, so here's my input example. So I've just got two. So 1, 2, and I have minus 2 and minus 3 and 1 and minus 1. So this here is the first example. This here is the second example. Okay, so I've got these. So what I want to do is I want to compute two iterations of the self-organizing map algorithm. So compute two iterations of SLM algorithm, okay? Okay, so let's say, you know, the, at the very beginning, what you have to do is you have to randomly choose examples. So let's say the first time I run this algorithm, I choose the second example, and the next time I run this algorithm, I choose the first example. So let's just put that all the way. So suppose, you know, the second training example was chosen at iteration one. And then the next example, sorry, was chosen at iteration two. So let's say the second example is chosen the first time and the first example is chosen the second time. So let's compute, let's actually go ahead and uh, do this algorithm here. So iteration number one. Okay. So I did all the initialization stuff. So the first part would be to choose a random example, which we already did. Right, so this is set to the second example. In this case, this is, uh, let's see, it was, uh, Three two. Sorry, it's uh, three two three two. Okay, I need to change this up a little bit. So, my bad. I wrote this wrong. So three two three two. Oops, I uh, made a little mistake. Okay, so let me just change this. Sorry. This is three two, and this is one and minus one. I have the example for this one, but then I forgot to update the actual. Update, update. I forgot to actually update the example in my notes. Okay, sorry. So the first example is. Uh, let's see here. Sorry. So this is 3, 2, and this is 1 and minus 1. Sorry about that. So the first one's 1 and minus 1, the next one is 3 and 2. Apologies. Okay, so we choose that to be the first example. So the next, what we have to do is we got to choose the BMU. Okay, so if you take a look at this grid, this, this is position 1, 2, and 3, right? So <clears throat> what we need to do is we have to calculate the distances. So the distance between this example and the first weight at iteration zero is just the, is just the difference, right? It's basically, uh, let's see here. Uh, yes, in feature space. So x would be three, right? Minus, and then what's the weight at uh, iteration one, which is zero, zero, right? So you got three minus zero squared plus two minus zero squared. So what you're doing is you're finding the distance between the feature with the actual weight itself and this is just equal to 1. It's equal to uh, 
4 and then 9, which is the square root 13. Okay? Then you've got to find the distance between this feature and the next weight. Okay? So this is 3 minus, and then what was it? It was uh, 1 and 0. So you have 3 minus 1 squared plus 2 minus 0 squared. Okay? So this would be 9 and then, sorry, 2 and 2, which makes this 8. Finally, we compute the distance between the input with the last weight. So this is 3 minus 0 plus 2 minus 1. Okay? This is 9, this is, and this would be square root 10. Okay. So you actually don't have to look at the square root. You can just take a look at the number itself, you, you know, because it's still small. So out of everything here, this one is the best matching unit. So neuron number 2 is the BMU. Okay. So that's the uh, best matching unit. And then what you need to do next is you have to do the update. So update the weights. Okay, update the weight. So the equation for this, to go to the next step, is simply the previous weight, and then you have to add in your uh, learning rate stuff, right? So this is alpha t, h, x, i, t, and then this is x minus. So this is the one for one d. Okay, so currently the time step is zero, right? So to go to the next time step, we need the previous time step, Okay, plus the uh, learning rate currently, the initial learning rate, and then, and then this. So we just have to substitute this for the first, second, and third weights. So this is the equation that we need. So <clears throat> the first weight we want to update, the previous one was just 0, 0, okay, alpha 0. So let me just calculate that quickly. So let me just, uh, cop let me just cut this out, let me just cut, it. let me just, uh, calculate the actual stuff here before I continue. So alpha 0 is equal to, and this is tau 1, right? This is equal to 1, so it's just going to be this, which is 1. And then you want to do the same thing for standard deviation here. It's so just, and this is just equal to that, which is 0 0.5, okay? And then finally, you want to apply the decay. So x of i is 0 is equal to just e to the power minus, and then we have an x and i, and this is just equal to, uh, let's see here, okay, all right, and then if you square this, this just becomes 0 0.25, but I'll talk about that later. Okay, so I have all these computed, so now what I need to do is calculate the weight updates. So we have this here. Okay, so alpha is 0, so this becomes 1, and then uh, let's see here, 0 0.5, so we have e to the minus, so we have, let's see, the best matching unit, this was equal to 2, the best matching, the position is equal to 2. Okay, so this is 2, right, so we have 2 minus 1 squared, right, and then we have, this is actually equal to 0 0.25, okay, and then this is equal to x, we have Let's see, 3, 2, and then minus 0, 0. Okay, so let's see here. Da, 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 da. 1, 0 0.5. Okay, so this number here, if e to the minus 1 divided by 0 0.25, that's equal to roughly 0 0.1355. Okay, so 0, 0, and this is 1, 0 0.1355, 3, 2, 0, 0. And when you compute this, the final update you get is 0 0.401, 0 0.271. So that's the update for the first weight. Now we got to do it for the next one. Okay. So the next one was, I believe, let me see, what was it? It was, uh, sorry, 1, 0. So 1, 0. Okay. We can put all this in. It's going to be the same. Actually, no, not the same. So with this one here, we have e to the minus 2 minus 2. Okay, this is equal to 1 because of 2 minus 2, and then we have 3, 2, 0, 0. Okay, so when we compute this, right, let's see, so you have plus, oh sorry, 1. This is actually just equal to 3, 2, which is kind of cool actually, which makes sense. So if you want the, because the best matching unit was neuron 2, 
there shouldn't be much of an update, so we should get the original one, which is nice. And finally, we have 0, 1, and then plus 1, and then this e to the power of minus, and then the position was equal to 3 instead of 2. All right, so the neural position is 3. And then this is 0 0.25. Okay, this is also equal to 0.1355 as well. So you have 3, 2, 0, 1. Okay, so when you have this, when you actually do everything, this is actually equal to the same value, which is kind of cool, I guess. 2, uh, 7, 1. Okay, so that's the first iteration. Okay, I'll do one more. Actually, what I'll do is I'll just write out what the answer is, and then you can work it out yourself. So let me just write this down. So iteration number 2. Because I want to actually get on to uh, the next topic. So the first iteration, what you need to do is we need to first calculate. Well, you don't have to first calculate this, but you can do this beforehand. We need to calculate what the next learning rate would be. So this is alpha 0 e to the minus 1 over uh, tau 1. And this is 1.45. Okay, This is equal to 1. So I actually chose this on purpose. When you actually compute this, this is roughly equal to a half. So 1 times 0 0.5 is roughly 0 0.5 here. And then if you do the same thing for the standard deviation, I made this 1.45 as well. So when you compute this, it's rough. So this would be 0 0.5. And this is roughly equal to 0 0.5 as well. So you get roughly 0 0.25. So you do this. And then when you find the best match, so let's see here. So we choose the input example. Right, This is mapped to the first one, which is equal to minus 1, 1. Or 1 minus 1, sorry. Okay. So next one, so when you want to choose the uh, best matching unit, okay, I'll let you guys compute the distances yourself. So when you do this for the next weight, this is actually 1.974. If you do this for the weight after this, we get square root 13. And then when we do this again, sorry, this is 1. you also get 1.974 as well. So this is a situation where we have two that are actually the same. So one of these is the best matching unit, so you can choose one at random. So uh, one and three are BMUs, but choose, I guess the first one at random. So choose number one uh, at random because uh, you have more than one possibility, okay? So when you do the update, I'll let you guys do this yourself. So the next update here, I'll just write down the calculation for you. So in this case, this would be 1.1015. And this is minus 0.3645. The next one after this is, let's see here. Uh, hmm, still 3.2. That's nice. And then finally, the last one is uh, slightly different because that's not the best matching unit anymore. Uh, it's actually the same because when you do the when you do the actual uh, decay stuff, it's actually quite small. Seven one. Okay. All right. So those that's it, and then you you finish. Okay. So that's a nice numerical example. Just to watch your whistle, I'll put put up a practice problem that you'll be able to solve, and then I'll do another example during the actual review session. Okay. All right, and that's it for best. That's it for self-organizing. That's all I have. Let me just take a look. Okay, I'll uh, talk for about 10 more minutes and then we'll take a break. Okay, so the next topic I'm going to talk about is evolutionary computing. So I'm going to end the course by talking about this really cool topic. So there's not that many classes left. I'm going to finish this topic next week and then the week after that is just review. So uh, we're actually, this is the last topic for the course. Okay, so evolutionary computing. So what I mean by evolutionary computing is that it is inspired by biological evolution. Okay, so these are algorithms that try to find the optimal parameters to a cost function by modeling this problem based on what you see in biology and in evolution. All right, so this is actually, I like to save this topic for last because it's, a, it's probably the, it's a really cool topic and it's kind of like a reward for you for sticking it out and for staying. All right, so these are uh, algorithms. Uh, 
that find the minimum of a cost function by concepts used in uh, nature and evolution. Okay, so the motivation behind this is, is actually a very simple one. So here's the, here's our motivation. Okay, so far what we've seen is uh, when you try to find the minimum of a cost function, you start off with some initial points and then you apply updates through gradient descent to try to find the minimum of this cost function. Okay, with evolutionary computing, what you're doing is you are providing solutions in parallel. So instead of just choosing one solution, you randomly choose, let's say, 20 or 30 different solutions, and you make sure you check to see what the costs of those are, and then you keep, let's say, the 10 best ones or the 20 best ones, discard the other ones, and then you keep evolving those until you finally get a good solution. One of them will probably give you uh, a, nice, a nice minimum. Okay, so suppose uh, we have a cost function you know, j of theta, okay? So, you know, j of theta, right? And we can, you know, uh, assume we have just two features for now. Not two features, but uh, two, yeah, two features for now. Actually, it's one feature because of the bias term. Let's assume we just have one feature for now. And there's, you know, theta zero and theta one, okay? So, <clears throat> in classical optimization algorithms, such as gradient descent, okay, we provide an initial starting point. Okay, and we update to move uh, this closer to the minimum. That's what we usually do, right? So that's what is done traditionally. So you start off with some initial set of parameters, and then you keep moving these parameters up until the point where you hopefully converge to a global minimum. Okay. So this, what the key behind this that is that it only looks for one solution. Looks for only one solution. Okay. So this may converge to a local minimum. So that's one of the problems. If your cost function is not convex, then it may converge to a local minimum, and unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so that's in traditional optimization that we've seen so far. In evolutionary computing, we generate several initial positions. So instead of just generating one, we generate maybe 20 or 30 initial positions, and we find updates for each of these positions. And then eventually one of them is probably, or hopefully miraculously land on the global minimum. And then you just keep evolving these positions until you find one that actually is the global minimum. Okay? So in an evolutionary computing we generate several uh, initial positions, initial points. Okay? And we find uh, updates for all of these in parallel. Okay, so what we're doing is we're actually creating a population of solutions. So you can think of a cell culture as being a population of cells. We're creating a population of solutions where we take each of these little cells and we try to mutate them so that we move them closer towards a better solution. And eventually one of these cells will converge to a global minimum and that will hopefully be it. Okay, so we generate a population of solutions. 
Okay, so this will give us a better chance of finding the global minimum and escaping a local minimum. So this gives us a better chance to find the global minimum. Okay, so a graphical example that I always like to give is something like this picture. Okay, so as I talked about before, let's assume we have just two features for now. And this is plotted on a 3D grid, so you can think of this as, as just theta 0 and theta 1. Okay, and you can think of this as a 3D graph where this could be the first, the bias term, this could be this, you know, the feature we want, and then this is the actual cost function. Okay, so in green, this here is traditional gradient descent. So this is classical optimization. Okay, so this is the initial starting point and then you move towards some minimum. These, these things in pink are what the evolutionary computing approach does. What you're doing is you're generating several different positions at one time and you update all these in parallel until one of them hopefully will find a global minimum. So what you want to do is you want to find it in such a way where if the, you know, if the actual cost function is less than some threshold, that's when you stop. Okay, so we have all these here in pink and that's what the evolutionary computing does. So all, all these things here, uh, you know this, all these here, this is evolutionary computing. Okay, so that's what we want to model. We're modeling this is based on, you know, cell population growth, population death, and all that stuff. Okay, so in a nutshell, we can chalk out the process of evolutionary computing to these three basic steps. Okay, so evolutionary computing. Let me just lay out these steps and then we'll take a break. Can be uh, broken down. into uh, these steps. It's not three, it's mostly two, but okay. Let me just write these down and then I'll let you guys go for a break. So, one. The first thing that you need to do is you have to generate a population of initial solutions. We like to call this a population of structures, where each structure is an initial starting point that you want to look at. So generate a population of structures. Okay, so each structure uh, forms a representation uh, of one possible solution. Okay, so that's the first step. The second step, I'm just going to write this down, and then uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll take a break. So we're going to repeat until satisfied. We're going to repeat this process until we're satisfied. So the first step you want to do is you want to test these structures for quality. So there's going to be some quality metric that you assign to each of these little structures, which is a, you know, one possible solution to the uh, cost function. And you want to test the quality of each of these and you want to do something with each of the qualities. So test the structures for quality. Okay. The next thing that you want to do is you want to, based on the quality, you want to select only certain structures to be able to reproduce and you know mutate these structures in such a way where you're creating new uh, examples based off the old ones, where the new ones will hopefully give you a better quality than the old ones, and then you discard the ones that are pretty bad. Okay. So you select uh, structures for reproduction. Okay, so what I mean by this is that somehow we would like to use good solutions to generate better ones. It's the same thing as having, you know, two parents having a child, right? So that child should embody the best qualities between both of the parents. And that's what we're doing here. So if we have two good solutions, we want to merge them together in some way to produce another solution or another set of parameters that are better than the other two were. 
And you keep doing this, you keep repeating this until finally you come to a particular structure which will give you the best possible solution to your optimization problem. Okay, so we would like to use good solutions to uh, generate better ones. Okay, and then you want to produce uh, new variations. I'm almost done. This is the second last step. Variations of the selected structures. Structures. Okay, and then D. Replace old structures with new ones. Okay, so doing this will allow us to throw away all the bad solutions that didn't work and only keep the good ones. So we're going to be progressively getting better and better solutions until hopefully one of them will give you the most optimal parameters you need to satisfy your, to satisfy your needs. Okay, so doing this, this is my last point and then we'll take a break. Doing this will uh, throw away bad solutions and uh, keep the bulk of the population focusing on good solutions. Okay, and that's it. All right, so I'll take a break and then when we come back I'll uh, introduce genetic algorithms which is uh, one of the most common methods for evolutionary computing that exists.